My name is Jeff Burt. Several years ago, I started this YouTube channel because it pained me to see people struggling to work on their vintage computers and the things like, you know, I replaced that chip five times and it still doesn't work. So I just wanted to pass on what I had learned. Uh, that's it right there, some of my recent videos. Um, I thought the best way to start this sort of talk, it's on uh, physical and cosmetic restoration of vintage computer equipment, is to go in the order of operations that we would perform these things when we're working on the equipment. Yeah, that is, uh, we're going to probably clean it first because it's old and dirty and, and stuff. We're going to do some physical repair, then we might do some refinishing work. Um, I, I'm starting with this this question right here because of a lot of interesting ideas that people propose on the various internet forums about the way they clean their equipment. So now that you've had a few seconds to ponder these questions, I bet everybody thought of soap, right? Um, yeah, I, I, I've seen things like I rinsed it with water and wiped it with alcohol, right? And then my refinishing didn't work. And it's like, well, yes, because it, it just wasn't clean. Uh, soap seems boring, but it is a great example of everyday household chemistry. Soap is, or water is a solvent. Soap is an emulsifier that lets oil and grease mix with the, the solvent water. We can wash it away. Great stuff. Um, and washing our equipment doesn't take anything fancy. Uh, here I am working on some large stuff that I'm washing. So I'm doing so outside with a big bucket for uh, stuff that has a lot of scuffs on it and stains and things like that. You can use something like uh, some Mechanics hand cleaner, orange hand cleaner in a brush. There's also uh, a thing called Melamine sponge or a magic eraser that works really good. All of the stuff that you use, your rags, scrub brushes, and these sponges and things like that, they're slightly abrasive. So you can change the luster on plastic a little bit. Um, it's not like you're using sandpaper, but keep that in mind. I've had some cases with a, with a magic eraser that I went back with some plastic polish and just kind of smoothed the area and restored the luster. But you don't dunk it. Um, yes, yeah, sometimes I'll soak it. it, depending on how dirty it is. I'll soak like the plastic enclosure for uh -huh. a while and like keys like this. These are keys off a, a pocket computer. They were really, really, really grungy. Uh, you know, full-size keyboard keys, I'll soak those for a while and then scrub them with a brush. You know, just like dish soap, some mild cleanser like that, go from mild to wild. Don't start with a really harsh. Have you tried the ultrasonic bath? I have not. Okay. I don't have one. If I did, I probably would try that for many things. You can even wash circuit boards. A couple caveats. Um, if it has, the circuit board has relays or other open components that could water can leak in, you don't want to wash them without removing those. Uh, anything that has a 32 kilohertz real-time clock crystal, uh, you might want to be careful in an ultrasonic bath because it's awful close to the 40 kilohertz, right? And you can damage the crystal. And here I am actually using distilled water because in Missouri we're built on top of a network of limestone caves. so. Our water is full of lime and it'll get on everything. So I'm just using distilled water, brush some soap, <coughs> rinse it, dry it. If you wash your circuit boards, get them very, very, very dry. At least let them dry overnight. Uh, you can blow them off with a low pressure compressed air. Uh, you can rinse them with like a 99% a alcohol. That'll help dry it faster. Uh, sticky residue. There are several ways you can clean sticky residue. There are uh, old standbys like WD-40, specific products like Goo Goin. Um, I find petroleum-based products like this usually work. They're the safest for a wide variety of substrates. Uh, alcohol works great for many things too. You can have problems on some painted surfaces with alcohol. I found out the hard way that silver paint that many old computing devices are painted in does not play well with alcohol. Richard. Um, Goo Gone is great for the adhesive for la from labels, but Goo Gone itself leaves a film. Right. What's good for getting that off? Um, well, it does work, but it's not really the Yes, that's, that's the thing. Generally, I will wash and degoo, and then you're stuck washing again. 
Some things have so much goo on it, you have to like do that in reverse, and some you have to do right. each process multiple times to get it clean. Have you tried vegetable oil? Um, yeah, that can work for works certain for, sticky things. For, yep. For a lot of sticky, like scotch tape residue, yep. vegetable oil dissolves it. And then you, then you have the problem, of course, with an oil film, which you, you still have to wash it off with regular yep. detergent. Or even what's even better than detergent, because it leaves no residue, is the household ammonia, clear ammonia. Yep. An excellent mild solvent for things that alcohol will help with are mineral spirits. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. I knew a guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that can be good for like greasy yeah, metal gears and stuff. Like so. You want to remove the sticky thing? Mm -hmm. Gas is fun to But it'll get your plastics. Yeah. Yeah. Got to know what the material is. Yeah. Uh, so here's just a couple example of removing uh, gummy stuff. This is a TR-80 Model 4P keyboard that has this rubber strip at the bottom that you have to remove to get the keyboard apart. And of course, after 40 years, it's all cracked anyhow. So you scrape that off there with a plastic instrument, not something metal. Uh, you can buy spiders cheap everywhere now. And, you know, I think I used WD-40 on it. This is a printer cassette interface for a TR-80 Model 1 that I called the pig pen machine. And then I found some bedding slips and the, it came in this sexy velour case. And there was these bedding slips in there. And somebody said, well, those bedding slips are from Florida. I bet that was at a dog track, not, you know, not a pig pen. So that could be. But there was copious amounts of tape and dirt and goo and everything. And actually, the whole machine cleaned up remarkably well for as dirty as it was. Uh, corrosion, right? One of our arch enemies. Uh, the first step to cleaning corrosion is to mechanically abrade the area. Scrape off as much as you can safely without causing more damage. Um, things like a wire brush, fiberglass pins, scotch bright, a fine sandpaper. Um, and then maybe a mild acid or uh, base, depending on what you're trying to clean up. I, I can't remember the name, but uh, uh, it's a um, it's, it's a, a green fiber and it's fairly thin and has just the right abrasive. Scotch bright. Scotch -Brite. Yep. Yes. 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 Yep. Scotch bright. Yes. CLR. Yes. Yep. CLR. Uh, double string finger. Yep. <laughs> so, if you guys don't know about these already, fiberglass pins, they are the greatest thing since sliced bread for circuit boards, small areas on metalwork and things like that. Um, yes, I, uh, I, uh, I, on an impulse bought a totally rusted 24 inch bench plane uh, for a buck and a half at the Kickapoo Trading Post in Wisconsin. It had been out in the snow and rain for 10 years and was severely rusted. I took it home. I built a little box for it. I, I dropped a, a big plastic bag in the box and I filled it with uh, vinegar from uh, Costco, which is not very expensive. I, I, I took the plane apart, washed all the parts with detergent, and then I soaked all the parts in the vinegar for about three days, and the rust is transformed into this black, gooey stuff that is easily wiped off. And the thing, the thing, absolutely looked good as new. And, and a, I ended up with a three hundred dollar bench plane for a buck, for a buck and a half plus the cost of some vinegar. Yep, it doesn't take a lot of effort. A lot of times, um, these little brass or stainless steel wire brushes on a Dremel tool or things like that can do wonders, especially in tight areas on. You know, we got uh, in a lot of equipment some RF shields and everything that are bent up in funny shapes and you can really get into the nooks and crannies and get it cleaned out. And what do you do with what's left over if you want to get it as clean as possible? Well, you need to know what, your, what residue you're cleaning up. Um, if it is from something like alkaline batteries, well, that was an alkaline, so you want to neutralize it with an acid. My favorite is citric acid, which is sort of what's in CLR. Uh, you can buy the anhydrous citric acid like this. This was like eight or nine dollars on Amazon. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, you mix that with about um, 
one and a quarter liters of, of warm water, it'll, it'll dissolve and you have about a 40% solution of citric acid, then you can uh, cut that down for different things you're working on. So I don't use it in 40%, that's just a nice strength to dissolve it in. Uh, concentrated cleaners like this, Purple Power, they sell at like automotive parts stores. That is a fairly mild uh, caustic basic solution that's good for cleaning up acids like from electrolytic capacitors. You'll see people online like trying to clean those with vinegar, but the electrolyte in the capacitor that leaks out and corrodes everything is actually an acid. So if it's bad enough you need to neutralize it, you need to use a base. The back plate of after the vinegar treatment? Um, our old friend corroded battery contacts. So uh, if it's bad enough uh, that you can't clean it off with some mild abrasion and you can't get the battery contacts out of the thing like this particular uh, machine, it's a two-part uh, battery holder that's welded together, sonic welded together. You can mix some glycerin, about 10, maybe 15% of glycerin with your acid, dab that on there, and that gives it just enough viscosity to stay in place and do its job. Here is a plate that's out of a uh, Sharp CE150 printer cassette interface that was really, really a sad sight. Um, and I, I did my best to bring it back to health but a uh, leaking and outgassing NICAD battery pack did this to one of the RF shield on the bottom. And with some scraping and I mixed some uh, glycerin and citric acid together and um, just wiped on the surface because that used less uh, material, less acid than dunking the whole thing. And you know, after a little polishing with the scotch Brite and cleaning up, it painted up really nice. Pretty good. Um, unfortunately, the circuit board did not fare as well. It had some more severe problems, and um, it, it, was, it looks nicer. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is the same machine. Uh, this type of thing here can also happen with outgassing NICAD batteries. Uh, a little citric acid, wiping it down, and then buffing that lightly with a magic eraser can restore a lot of the original look. It will never be perfect without repainting it, but this looks pretty darn good from uh, what it uh, started with. And a lot of times that's good enough. You, know, you can get back to 80-90%. Corrosion can get in other parts of the equipment. This is an RS-232 interface, uh, another leaking battery pack, and fortunately this particular ribbon cable inside of here is clear and you can see how the corrosion has leached all the way through it. On your battery leads from the uh, battery rechargeable battery packs or in things, it will do the same thing. Sometimes like, you know, six inches, 100 millimeters down those leads, that corrosion will leach. So you can't just cut it off at the battery pack and try to solder that onto a new pack. It will not stick very well most of the time. And when something gets this bad, you've got to replace it. There's, there's no remediation that can do it. And of course, it's all over the board. Fortunately now we've got resources like AliExpress and things like that where we can find replacement cables like this. It's, it's at least a possibility now. Sometime corrosion comes in very unexpected places. This is a Shark PC1500 also sold by Radio Shack as the PC2. Some of them came with this moldy block of goo option. Um, this end of the circuit board is where the LCD is under the board. And they put, it's this sort of waxy type of stuff with sawdust or something in it. And it absorbs moisture, it molds after 40 years, and you wind up with a rusty plate. Luckily that plate is fairly easy to get out and you can clean it up. Just because the thing looks good on the outside does not mean it's good on the inside. So you can imagine another five years of this and that will be eating the circuit board. Uh, corroded circuit boards. I'll hear all the time people say, well, it doesn't look bad. It doesn't look that corroded. Well, you've got to scrape the, all that stuff off the circuit board away from the capacitors. And you can see you can wind up with breaks under there and they're not always nice big breaks like this. A lot of times you can have 
uh, you know, 10, 15 millimeters away from where it was leaking, there is a thin trace that goes to a pad and it is broken maybe a quarter of a millimeter right next to the pad and you can't see it without magnification. And you'll drive yourself crazy trying to find where that break is because sometimes it'll even be intermittent. What happened to the capacitor? Um, oh, it's in the trash can. Yep. They, this, this is a TRS-80 Model 100. It seems like in, let's say, 81, 82, when these sub-miniature electrolytics started coming out and things, they were re really, really terrible. After a couple of years, they were okay. So the, the uh, next model they came out with, the 102, did not have this problem. But there are several machines in this era that do. Uh, conductive rubber, we find this in a lot of our machines, zebra strips for add-on modules, for LCDs, keypads, key switches on keyboards, things like that. Uh, the conductive rubber can oxidize, common on key switches. It can become contaminated externally from grease and oil from, you know, hinging keyboard parts. And believe it or not, silicon rubber can leach silicon oil. This is an extreme example where it looks like this remote keypad is sweating. And I actually found a, it was either a Japanese or Chinese paper on this, and they talked about the manufacturing conditions that can lead to this phenomenon. Um, there are industrial cleaners that can take care of this, which come in 55 gallon drums. It's, <laughs> it's not really uh, available to the hobbyist. And I had problems with key switches like this. These are from keyboards that were made by Mitsumi. And I built a little fixture to test them in so I could test the resistance in a repeatable manner, like shown over here on the other side. And I, I found out what worked best after doing all the reading I could is I read some things that suggested that a, a mild uh, basic solution might clean them. And I tried several household chemicals, ammonia, the concentrated, you know, automotive cleaner. And uh, those work pretty good. Some really high resistance contacts, say several hundred ohms, might take four days of soaking uh, in the solution to bring the resistance down. And of course, they were kind of waterlogged then. So you had to rinse them and then maybe soak them in alcohol. Uh, a German friend of mine said, you should try lye. He said like a teaspoon of lye, a couple hundred milliliters of water. And that takes the soak time down to maybe four or five hours. I had a, a really cranky LCD module on an Epson HX20 a few weeks ago that took about four or five hours of soaking in lye to rejuvenate the zebra strips. And you can't always rejuvenate zebra strips because they tend to stay compressed sometimes and you're just stuck. Yes? Success on how long it holds its new elastic form? Yeah, we'll see. I don't know. Yeah, some of them, it, it just depends on rubber. Some of them, once they're compressed, that's it, it's done. You'll never get it back together and working. Uh, examples of zebra strips. There are some places now in Taiwan and other places where you can get custom zebra strips made at not a terrible price. These are some I had made for a memory expansion module. These are harder to test the resistance of. So just an idea, I clamped the uh, zebra strip between two scrap pieces of copper clad board so I had a known contact area on each side, a semi-repeatable pressure. You can measure resistance, you know the, the thickness of the zebra strip, you know the contact area so you can figure out the resistance. You can't always get particularly large LCDs back together after you've replaced the zebra strips or cleaned the zebra strips or taken care of corrosion on the PCB. I 3D printed these little C-clamps. There's just a nut on the other side so I could position everything and test it and make sure it was all lined up before reassembling it. Saves a lot of time. Coating keypads. Cheap keypads have painted on conductive rubber, which flakes off. The best recoat kit I found, most of them don't work by the way. The best one I found was made by MG Chemicals, so they promptly quit making it. Um, after being distraught, uh, I realized that all the component parts of this kit were common off the shelf stuff. There is a little bottle of super glue, some super glue primer, which you can think of as like alcohol or a good cleaner or something like that. Yes? 
time schedule. Okay, I'll, I'll speed up. Anyhow, so the idea is you clean your rubber, you put a little super glue on there, the super glue sticks to the rubber, and then you can apply your conductive paint to the super glue. The paint sticks to the super glue. This particular keypad I did several years ago, it still works fine. Uh, this is a simple idea. It took me many years to figure it out because it was so simple. Uh, all our small equipment has little rubber feet. And they melt. <laughs> and yeah. And it finally dawned on me, instead of trying to find all these little different sizes of rubber feet, buy a hollow punch set and some strips of rubber of different thicknesses, and you can make your own feet. You can make them to order. It takes two minutes. Are they electrically conductive? No, you buy like neoprene rubber or something like that. It just depends on what type of rubber you buy. What's the it's a hollow punch set. Yep. It's a, it creates like the donut shape in there and then you have a solid disc of rubber. Ooh, interesting. And you can get them in uh, inch and metric diameters. Let me see where we're at. Okay, I will speed up greatly. Uh, physical repair of plastics. Plastic is not one thing. It's like saying metal. There are many different types of metal with many different properties. So you cannot fix all plastics the same way. You cannot glue all plastics, etc. They're different plastics, different failure types. Glues will divide into two broad categories. They're solvent glues. It chemically melts the glue. The melted parts stick together and you wind up with a different substance in between the base materials that's made out of the base materials. Epoxy, CA, construction adhesive. Uh, 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 an abrasive sandpaper really helps. Yes, together. yeah. With these, with the mechanical bond, they're just flowing into the surface imperfections in the base material, right? It's like tape in liquid form. So some common plastic failures are broken screw post, chunks of cases falling out or flying out. And uh, speaking of broken screw post, screws made for plastic are not the same as screws made for sheet metal. Sheet metal screws break plastic. Uh, generally speaking, screws made for plastic are blunt on the end, although there are some pointy ones for specific applications. Two types of uh, screws for plastic are thread cutting and thread forming, like, although they come in slightly different shapes. But you can see a sheet metal screw is pointy and it has very deep grooves, whereas a plastic screw, even if it's pointy, has shallower grooves and it's coarser. So don't use sheet metal screws. For broken screw post, you can create sleeves. I first did this several years ago by buying the, the brass and aluminum tubing from hobby stores. You can slit that with a uh, saw if you need to, if it has castellations. Here I machine these out of uh, ABS because these break all the time. You can 3D print sleeves for more com uh, complex shapes. For, uh, is that a laser or that's power? Oh, this is a, uh, mounting pad for a circuit board that's machined out of ABS and it has a nice wide base to allow surface area for gluing. Uh, flat areas like cases where you have cracks across them that are really terrible, you can glue that together with like acetone or something like that and put a mending plate on the back which will add a lot of strength to that. On this side I'm experimenting with stitching it back together. I didn't have any stainless wire, so I used copper wire and an old soldering iron tip. Do not use a good soldering iron tip for this because you will ruin it. And uh, I just melted the zigzag uh, copper into that and it made a good stitch. Uh, they do make tools for this, hot staple uh, machines, which is like a big soldering iron that you put a stainless steel staple in and melt it into the plastic. Uh, since I bought one, I have not needed it for anything for a vintage computer, but I did fix my truck bed cover. Clips and things that hold cases together, we can 3D print parts to take those up too. You just want to make sure you have plenty of gluing area and try to make the clip so it self-aligns. I'm trying to speed up through this. Uh, complex brakes. This is a motor mount for a small cassette deck that Radio Shack sold for their pocket computers. Uh, it got dropped. This all broke out right here. I glued all the pieces I could back in with acetone, that solvent welding. I wrapped some captan tape around a blunt syringe needle, shoved in the screw hole, and I built up the area with successive layers of baking soda and super glue. It is very messy. 
It is very simple. You don't need any fancy tools to do it. And you can build up complex shapes. And I filed it down with like a Dremel tool and some files and things like that. And to make it look a little better, I white painted over it with a Sharpie marker. And nobody will ever see that, but it makes me happy that it looks better. Quick question. We still don't know how long that lasts, because I've done it too. Yeah. But there is a question about... Yep. Yeah. How long it lasts, I don't know. Yep. Um, except it, you know, it's like some other repairs, it works now and it didn't work before. So however long it lasts, at least it works that long. Uh, when you get into metal repair, you can start getting into some more expensive tools and things like that. I'll just show you one really quick that I did. Uh, and I will bypass that. Well, let me just say for like front metal covers on keyboards and things like that on calculators and pocket computers. When I tried gluing those, it's always mixed results. I found this really thin double-sided tape by 3M. You slip a little piece of that under the, the lifting up corner, you push it down, you take a sharp X-Acto knife, trim off the excess. It works perfect. This stuff seems to be a very similar consistency to the type of adhesive they use from the factory for sticking those things down. It works great for larger rubber feet as well. Okay. Micro cassette deck used on an Epson HX20, just like used in 10,000 different answering machines back in the day. There's supposed to be a little metal nub right there that broke off. This is a 256 screw that was, I drilled a hole in this arbor, threaded the screw in a couple millimeters, turned down the shaft to the size of the shaft that was needed for the nub, drilled and tapped a hole in the arm, threaded the screw into the arm, and then cut it off. Now there's a nub in there. So sometimes you have to work in a very seemingly strange and a roundabout method to fix stuff like this. Uh, this is a metal gear out of the uh, Alps printer plotter mechanisms, which everybody used back in the 80s. This was not practical for me to make myself. Um, you can 3D print something like this. Getting the ID of the gear right and repeatable is tough. Uh, I finally found a contract manufacturer that would make them in reasonable quantities, you know, a few thousand at a time. It's a nice thing about having access to all this stuff online now. You can find a lot of places that will custom manufacture small numbers of parts. Uh, 3D printing. All to say about 3D printing, you can print lots of stuff. Higher resolution printers will print better things. The two types of printers we're going to find mostly as hobbyists are uh, FDM printers. That's the, the common ones with spools of plastic uh, wire that get melted like, a, like with a, a fancy glue gun, right? And you build up the shapes. There's also a resin printer, uh, which uses a UV curing uh, plastic resin that you can get much finer resolution. It's much, much messier. It's much more involved, but you can get better resolution. Uh, for example, this gear is about 12 millimeters in diameter. This text is one millimeter tall and 0.1 millimeters deep. I can't always get it to resolve that, but this is a gear for that same printer. Anytime you have a plastic gear pressed onto a metal shaft, you add 10 or 20 years and that shaft will break right there because plastic shrinks with age. It always will. There's nothing you can do about it. It's going to do that and it will always break. So in a TI Silent 700 printer, either the 740, later 745s or the 765, I found the original part was nylon and it had, uh, it had uh, basically some notches around the shaft that allowed for a little, a little bit of that shrinkage, but still after 20 years. Yep. Gone. Uh, refinishing. I'm going to go through this section again. I'll try to do it really fast. This provokes a lot of emotional responses from people. I'm not trying to convince you to refinish your equipment or not refinish it. I just want to provide factual information so you can make an informed decision. It's your gear. It's your choice. I have gear that I've refinished and I have some that I've left the same with stickers and you know writing on it because it was part of its history. Um, polishing plastic is an easy thing to start with. Not only can you polish plastic covers like this, and, you know, uh, screen covers after masking off the area, you don't want to get all the plastic polish into. This Novus brand is my favorite. After I'm done polishing it, I like to use Brilliant Eyes, although Novus also makes a product for that. Especially useful if you have a Novus calculator. 
Um, it also, this is another one of these things that's so simple, it took me years to, it, for it to occur to me. Uh, I had some faded keycaps here, and uh, it occurred to me that these were solid plastic, double shot injected like a lot of HP keys are, and uh, trying to retrobite dark colored plastics usually does not work well. So I polished them. I used a headlight cover polishing kit I had along with some polishing pads from a Dremel tool in a drill. Don't use a Dremel tool, it's too fast. Don't ask me how I know. <laughs> but you can see the difference here. This is the original faded one and this is how it should look like. And once you get the process down, it's pretty quick and you wind up with, you know, plastic that looks like it originally did. And since this was the smooth surface, uh, originally it was fine. I like coating, oops, I like coating plastic with this 303 protectant after I'm done cleaning it, refinishing it, or whatever. Uh, Retrobrite. Lots of myths around this one. I did a lot of research on the subject because the first time I heard of it, I thought it was the stupidest thing I ever heard of. Why would you use UV light to whiten your plastic when everybody knows that UV destroys plastic and turns it to mush? Right? Okay. Primer on light, you guys know this. White light made up of many wavelengths we call colors. It's what we perceive as colors. Uh, important thing here is the UV component. The, the parts of a molecule that cause the color we perceive are called chromophores and they really have to do with the single and double bonds in all these places. Uh, we can call that the shape of it, although that's not technically correct. But uh, how these bonds are formed they can change over time like due to UV exposure and it'll shift it toward the yellow. We can do other things which will shift it back toward blue. Uh, the same plast, the, the same uh, NES here, owned by the same person since new, has slightly different plastics from the factory that have yellowed in, in drast, uh, drastically different ways. You can see another one that didn't yellow like that. Um, it's just a slightly different mixture to the plastic. The, the yellowing process itself is natural. It will always happen uh, unless you get it down to like absolute zero, right? There's nothing you can do about it. Uh, a lot of people uh, like to blame bromine that is used in some fire retardants uh, because, you know, if you Google bromine, you see this picture and it's orange and they're like, oh my God, the plastic turns orange, it's bromine. The bromine leaches to the surface and makes it orange. At room temperature, bromine will evapor evaporate immediately. So unless your plastic is at the Arctic Circle, there's not gonna be any bromine on the surface causing problems. Some flame retardants containing bromine have been shown to cause yellowing to happen slightly faster. Um, so it's, you know, it may have some effect, some Bromine containing flame retardants haven't, don't do that. So it's not all bromine's fault. It's a combination of things. This is the worst yellowed case on a computer I've ever seen. It was basically the color of cheddar cheese. I did a long-term test to see if treating it would really turn it to mush. I like immersing the device to be retrobrighted in a five or 6% solution of hydrogen peroxide. Uh, I use these seedling mats wrapped around this plastic tub to heat it up to about 40 C. Uh, these bottles you've seen here are just taking up space. So I don't need as much hydrogen peroxide. So uh, what we're doing with this retrobiting is we're basically bleaching the plastic. We're, we're shifting, we're uh, altering those single and double bonds and shifting it back toward blue. Um, you can think of it like, you know, people have been sun brighting or sun bleaching things for hundreds of years, putting fabric and things outside. Um, the amount of treatment time to uh, do this is, you know, measured in hours or perhaps days compared to decades. It takes to yellow it. It's slightly different parts of the UV spectrum that, that cause each problem. So um, I haven't found and of course, you know, I won't be alive in 100 years to compare things I've done this to, but uh, I haven't found any dramatic effects. So here's the, the cheddar cheese case before it was treated, day one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. 
So I did this on purpose, right? To prove a point. This is seven days and 6% H2O2 at 40 degrees C. It did not turn the plastic to mush. The only thing on the case that got worse is the cooling vents right here. The cracks are already there opened up a little bit. Um, but every defect that was in the case to start with was still there. And it's brighter now. It looks a little nicer. It certainly didn't turn it to mush. If your plastic is brittle and cracked and falling apart, it doesn't matter what you do to it. It's going to be that way, right? I think it's a, a, a case of a logical fallacy, you know, after this, therefore, because of this, if you retrobrite it and then it falls apart, you think it was a retrobrite, even though it would probably fall apart beforehand. Uh, skip that. Painting. Mostly what I use painting for is to make things blend in like a gray GoTech and adapter and something like this. Though if you have a really busted case, sometimes filling in the cracks and repainting it is the only way to, to go. And if you have paint on plastic, you don't want to be there. This happens to be a Volkswagen Super Beetle air intake box that was covered in purple paint. Uh, dot three brake fluid will generally safely take the paint off of most plastics, but it's not safe on every plastic. So like anything else, test on an inconspicuous place first. So I just wetted rags with the dot three, placed on the plastic, let it soak there for you know hours or days and the paint will peel off and you haven't harmed the plastic and then you can wash it and repaint it if you want to. That's it. Questions? I think you cleaned up on that. <laughs> 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 uh, yes? Do you know about a vapor rust for rust treatment? Yes, I have used that on some like this same VW, the wheels. It does a good job, but you have to make sure that you get it, the stuff clean and dry afterwards because it's it'll be completely bare metal at that point and it will rust pretty rapidly. You went it with a black layer on it, is that right? I mean, I've, done this, I've done this with the salt before. How do you get the black layer on um, it? You usually have to wash stuff after you use something like that. The retro bright, you don't buy this, you have to make it. Yeah, it's just hydrogen peroxide. Somebody sells it under the retro right name, but it's just hydrogen peroxide. That uh, the bottles I showed there, you buy in a, a, a salon supply store. It, they call it volume 40, which means it's 20% hydrogen peroxide. You can still get that? Yeah. I thought the Homeland Security outlawed it because they use it to make acetone peroxide detonators. No, nope, you can still buy it in Missouri, but your mileage may vary. Uh, any techniques for identifying a particular type of plastic? Now, uh, on the uh, many plastics, they'll have the recycle symbol, mm -hmm. and they have a number in there, and you could often use that. Yeah, that didn't come out until the 90s, I think, and when you have older stuff, it's really hard to tell. Uh, I had somebody tell me one time, and I don't remember what he said, but there's ways that you can tell by burning a small sample of the plastic and the way it burns, but I don't remember any of that. Yeah, uh, do you ever get into repair of uh, calculator uh, but, uh, key contacts? I have, uh, yeah. I have some that are some perfectly good calculators, but the, the keys just don't make contact. Yeah, it just depends on what type of key switch that is, oh my what you need to do. If you uh, talk to me a little later, I can tell you how to clean those. Did you hear that? What? This, this, I forget your name. Was it? Yeah. Okay. All right. One more. Okay. No. Okay. I'm done. Thanks, everybody. Sorry I was late. <laughs>